Welcome to AUSA's Army Matters Podcast, focusing on what's important to the total Army community. We bring vital Army conversations and interviews on issues relevant to soldiers, military families, and all of you amazing Army supporters. Rotating each week, our show includes Soldier Today, Army Real Talk, Family Voices, and Thought Leaders. Let's tune into the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Sergeant Major of the Army, retired Dan Daly, and welcome to this edition of Soldier Today Podcast, part of AUSA's Army Matters Podcast series. Soldier Today Podcast is a product of the Non-Commissioned Officer and Soldiers Program Directorate at the Association of the United States Army. Soldier Today subjects focus on those topics that are relevant and needed by our soldiers and their families serving the regular Army, the Army National Guard, and the Army Reserve. During this episode of Soldier Today, we revisit the subject of the United States Army Non-Commissioned Officer Strategy. Last November, following the Sergeant Major of the Army's Annual Initiatives Brief at the 2020 AUSA Annual Meeting, Soldier Today reached out to TRADOC to find out more about the Army's ongoing efforts to modernize leader development for its Non-Commissioned Officer Corps. Here today to give us an update on the Army's NCO strategy and a few other things TRADOC has been working on since the last time we met is Command Sergeant Major Daniel Hendricks, the Command Sergeant Major of the United States Army Training and Doctrine Command. Sergeant Major Hendricks, welcome back to the Soldier Today Show, and thanks for joining us again. SMA, it's always great to talk to you and really appreciate the opportunity to come back here and talk about such an important topic. Well, we appreciate it. We know your time is valuable and precious. You've got the large enterprise of TRADOC to work through every single day. So we'll get right into the question, Sergeant Major, if you don't mind. Sergeant Major, SMA Grinston, again, gave his annual initiative briefing during this year's AUSA annual meeting conference, and he talked about a lot of subjects. One of those, again, was the NCO strategy. Can you provide our listeners with an update on what's been happening and what are we going to see in the future? Since the last time you and I talked, a lot has happened. We looked at what we're doing across the globe. You know, we closed down our effort in Afghanistan. And as we are in the transition, I would say, from counterinsurgency operations to large-scale combat, you know, what that means from a strategic competition standpoint. And so as we look across the force and we're under pressure of constant change, it was rapid technological advances. Our NCO Corps has got to develop that enduring and flexible strategy to lead us into the future. So what does that mean in real terms is really what we went after with the Army's NCO strategy. We coupled it with a This Is My Squad initiative and probably something that you and the older non-commissioned officers understand. We really wanted to get it in with what NCOs must be, know, and do, and more importantly, how they will compete in this multi-domain environment as we go forward. So, maybe we appreciate it. We know there's a lot of work going on, a lot of fronts inside this. As you said, this is my squad and the People First strategy. We're going to talk about that. But nested within the NCO strategy is a new concept called enlisted career long assessments. What are enlisted career long assessments and what's the objective of that? Well, SMA, I got to tell you, when you say enlisted career long assessments, it sounds pretty overwhelming and scary to a lot of folks. I sat down from, you know, young soldiers to our senior command star majors, even our officer cohort. And so what we really wanted to do as we talked about the NCO strategy, it's really getting back down to the basics and building cohesive teams at the squad level that link us into that highly trained discipline and fit. And they are ready to fight and win no matter where we put them on the planet. And so as you go into those categories and when we talk about these assessments, you go into the area of highly trained, disciplined, fit, and soldiers for life. And so that brings us to that category. We're talking about discipline. What does that mean? How do those counseling efforts come into place? And even as you talk soldier for life and talent management, that gets us into the enlisted career long assessments. And so if you think about it, and I'll put it in simplest terms, right? You are being assessed from day one when you're brought into the Army. Matter of fact, before even brought on, our recruiters are doing that with you, right? So they'll sit you down. You know, you'll go take a test. You'll sit through hours where you're being tested physically. You got something as simple as the OPAT, right? And that's the basic physical fitness assessment that you need to pass just to come into the Army. And so when we say career-long assessments, SMA, we're already doing the vast majority. What we did, not unlike what you did with our professional military education, we have synchronized them 
So that way you can link in those individual self-developed assessments as you go through your progression, no matter when you get out of the Army, no matter if it's after your first enlistment all the way until you become the next SMA like yourself. And so as you go along, you have touch points in and with TRADOC. And on average, that's about every three to four years, depending on where you're tracking. And so we have incorporated these assessments in everything from OPAT, basic training, going into our basic leaders course, all the way through when you go to the SAR Majors Academy. And so the key effort here is getting the assessments linked in, but more importantly, letting the operational force understand what it means because it's the operational force that will work with our soldiers on these individual development plans as we move forward. Like you started with, so I mean, that sounds like a lot, but I'm sure that as we go along and as you progress through this, our soldiers will get a better understanding. But to give our listeners a better understanding today, how does this affect junior soldiers? And then can you follow up with how does this affect our senior leaders who have been through a traditional process and now are in this new assessment process? Well, SMA, let's start where it really matters. And this is our junior soldiers coming in. What you don't want to find out is midway through your career that you have a significant blind spot or a significant deficit of what the Army is going to ask of you as you get promoted and you you kind of progress through the ranks. And so let's back up just a little bit, and I'll tell you there's multiple types of assessments. So, for example, we talk about developmental assessments. What we're really trying to do here is provide individuals with that information about themselves, right? What are your strengths? What is your weaknesses from a personal development standpoint? And we really try to help them focus on that. So, for example, that would be the leader 180. And so every time you go to a PME course, you're going to get the opportunity to get self and peer feedback that helps you understand not only how you see yourself, but how your peers see you and how your superiors see you. So that way you'll be able to address those blind spots and address, you know, what is important as those leader requirements continue to grow with you. Some other assessments that we have is what I would put in the diagnostic assessment. And so really these are going to be used by the institution to help us kind of understand a start point and they're focused on what will drive widespread organizational change. So, for example, you heard me mention it earlier, the OPAT. So when you come into the Army, you're given an OPAT, which is basically a very simple physical assessment that can help you inform the institution of individuals coming in so we can get you on the right path right off the bat. And then, obviously, the last one I think is really important for our junior enlisted is the predictive assessment. And these are assessments that are really going to matter to you, right? And these are assessments that will be used solely by the institution to make assignments. So as you are moving up through the ranks, it's really important to understand what the Army is looking at. What we are doing is ensuring that there are, for example, writing assignments at every level of PME that you will be assessed on so you don't get to the SAR Major Academy and wonder like, how are you going to grade me on this now? And you haven't been kind of prepping me to be successful in this stage as we go forward. So I think that is really what is important when you look at developmental, diagnostic, and predictive. What does that mean in real terms for our soldiers as they move through the ranks? And then more importantly, we've really got to help educate our senior leaders. Because if you're going to be a mentor, if you're going to counsel folks, and you're going to help those soldiers understand how important this is, That is where TRADOC will work through our NCO academies, and they will become the hub of expertise to work with those operational force senior leaders. They're there at your station, and they can help you properly prepare those soldiers as they move forward. SAR Major sounds like a very comprehensive plan, you know, progressive and sequential throughout your career. That works in both directions, it sounds like to me, that informs the individual, their strengths and weaknesses, but also gives the chain of command indicators on what they need to help the soldier or continue to sustain their strengths on. So, Major, what does all this mean to people first strategy? We hear the SMA, we hear the chief say that all the time, and we hear them talk talent management. How is this all nested? Les May, what I would tell you, people have always been first, right? You know, I think when you and I were growing up, um, as a matter of fact, it's always been mission first, people always. So I don't think this is a new framework for us. I think it's just 
us getting back to the balance of our mission and the people. And so one of those things that matters, and we talk about it all the time, we talk about what does it mean when you have a toxic leader? And that is kind of ill-defined. It gets pretty nebulous. And so when we start talking about, hey, as a leader, what is important? How do you engage your junior soldiers? How do you engage your organization? What does it mean to be engaged? You know, all these things we take for granted are not things that some of our soldiers have inherently built in. And so that's why we're tying them into our professional military education. And more importantly, what this really means as we go forward is we're giving them to tools to really focus on a more holistic approach, right? We absolutely still want soldiers that are experts in their craft, that are great with their weapon systems, but we also need leaders that know how to engage and how to have one of those tough and hard personal discussions with soldiers who may be going through a tough time, soldiers may who have family issues, financial issues. This is the piece that we are really putting a lot of effort into, and it really does take a broader, kind of more holistic approach as we go forward. Well, Sergeant Major, I appreciate that, and I know our listeners appreciate the perspective on it because there's a lot going on in this space with the Army right now. We hear a lot about it, and it's great to get an update from you. Sergeant Major, TRADOC's got more things they're doing than time that I have today to interview you, so I want to shift uh, our discussion a little bit. E3B, an interesting subject I just recently read about. And the Army's working to align three of the tests that are used to evaluate proficiency in individual critical tasks within specific military occupational specialties. Now, along with providing excellent training opportunities, these tests are used to qualify soldiers to wear the coveted badges associated with each of them. And many of our listeners will be familiar with things like the EIB, or Expert Entry Badge, and the EFMB, the Expert Field Medical Badge, and the newest one, the ESB, the Expert Soldier Badge. So, Sergeant Major, can you help our listeners understand, E3B, what's the purpose behind combining them? So, SMA, as we look at this, it's really about reps and sets. And I'll just give you um, my personal experience as a brigade Sergeant Major in a mechanized division. What we realize very rapidly as we talk about building experts Right. And that starts at the individual level as you focused on things like the expert infantry badge, expert field medical badge. You want to build experts within your formation, especially at the squad. Right. We want experts in every squad. And so that starts with a foundation associated with your military occupational skill and going after this expertise. What we found was problematic is that they became cumbersome. They became resource intensive. And when you have very little white space on a calendar, you realize very rapidly where did the excellence in infantry badge fall when it came to gunnery, the National Training Center, deploying over to name your space on the planet. It would slowly start to drop itself off. Matter of fact, as a brigade CSM, I would tell you we were lucky that we had one EIB over a two-year period. So what does that mean in real terms? Well, that has an impact on morale for your 11 Bravo soldiers. That has an impact on promotion, right? So when you look at promotion, every 11 Bravo, every infantryman in the Army knows if you want to be viable for promotion, having your EIB is a critical step in that next aspect. So when we came into TRADOC, we put a significant effort into, okay, Without lowering the standards, we have still maintained the standard. We still maintain the individuality of each one of these expert badges. How can we, in essence, bring these processes together to minimize the resources to allow them to conduct these efforts together? And so this started about two years ago when we brought the ESB on board, the expert soldier badge. We now have all three of them, and we said, okay, what is keeping us from running these three events simultaneous? So the first thing we started was, hey, let's look at those tasks that are the same with the EIB, ESMB, and the ESB, right? So, you know, lock and load an M240 Bravo, regardless where you're doing it, should be one standard. So it doesn't matter if your MOS is a 68 Whiskey or, you know, you're an 11 Bravo. Locking and loading an M240 Bravo should be the standard across the Army. So we, in essence, went through and aligned and identified 62 different challenges where, and and I don't know how else to put it, we had 
different standards because proponencies were kind of doing their own thing. So we brought those three proponencies together. We aligned those tasks. We cleaned up some of the administrative overhead. And probably most importantly, we had the full support of the 10th Mountain Division who was willing to conduct these to give us real-time feedback to make those on-the-spot changes. So what does that mean for the operational Army and the Army moving forward? As a matter of fact, General Garrett, the Force Com Commander with General Funk, just talked about it in a leadership development program he and General Funk had. And he said it has fundamentally changed the effort within that division and now going forward within Force Com. And so what do I mean by that? He goes, they now have more EIB, EFMB, and ESBs within that one division than they do in the rest of Force Com combined. They have more experts down at the squad level where they can actually have your squad leader going through with his squad in these efforts. And I would tell you, in the first time in my 30 years of service, they had a division run three of these events in one year. So I was just telling you, as a brigade sergeant major, I was lucky to one run in two years, and they just ran three in one year. And so it gets at the reps and sets that we are looking for. And what does it really mean to be highly trained, to be fit, and to be disciplined within that cohesive unit, within that squad? This effort has gone a long way to operationalize that so soldiers know exactly what that means where they're at. Well, Sergeant Major, I can tell you this. I can sympathize with the amount of time and resources it takes to run all of these separately. I think the idea is brilliant. I probably should have done it many years ago, but I wasn't as smart as you guys are on the team now. I think it's a great thing. But to satisfy our critics out there, we're still going to preserve the individuality and the sanctity and the honor and tradition of the EIB, the EFMB, and the ESB, right? SMA, that is one of the biggest challenges we hear when people hear about this because they think we're meshing them all together and it's one standard. And so I'll give you a very specific example of the answer to that question is overwhelmingly yes. They will still maintain the sanctity. The proponencies will still own what those standards are. So, for example, the physical fitness event will be the same. So push-ups, sit-ups, two-mile run, and EFMB had a standard. And as we look at EIB, they had a standard. And, you know, over the years, depending on how the proponency looked at it, it did shift a little here or there. But the point is, that standard will still be maintained by the proponency. But here's where the magic happens, right? So we have EIB holders, EFMB holders, and ESB holders as graders. And so as we bring all these folks in to do the PT event, and so it's a little off because we're about to solidify the fitness test for the Army with the ACFT. Once that's solidified, the events will all be the same. How many you do will be based solely on the badge that you are going for. But in essence, the high standards that put you into that you know, top 25%, top 10% will still be maintained by the proponencies. What it just does is allow us to execute that with all three of those soldiers going through for each one of the different badges. Yeah, and I hope our listeners out there, and I know they will understand once they see it, this is going to make it available to many more soldiers because the time and resources have been consolidated, and it gives units the flexibility, like you said, to operate within a confined space of, of time. It's so difficult. It's the unviable resource. So real quick from a talking point so we can move on to our majors, why is it so important to get more soldiers into this? Yes, May, I'll tell you, it goes back to what I think has always been one of our toughest challenges. You know, as you look at the schedules that we face, the daily role of what it means to be a soldier in the Army, and when we start talking about national training centers, you know, it's about brigades and battalions and how they interact. And so what we've always struggled with is, where do you find the time to focus on those individual skills? And then most importantly, where do you find the time to evaluate how well you're doing? And honestly, between you and I, I actually don't care about the 10% who get their badges. Any soldier who has ever gone through an EIB or an EFMB and now an ESB, they will tell you it is the best individual training event that they will get an opportunity to go through. 
So for you to go through three individual training events at that skill and that level and that quality within one year, SMA, that is something that we were never able to accomplish. And I got to personally witness it with 10th Mountain Division. So those reps and sets matter. And it's those individual skills that are going to pay off in the long run. Yeah, absolutely, sir, man. And you're exactly right. I've never seen a division do three of those in a year. It's incredible opportunity. And it gives commanders the opportunity to get their soldiers trained on individual tasks. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about the next topic in just a moment. Have you purchased your AUSA swag yet? Be proud to show your support for AUSA, which in turn shows your support for the U.S. Army and our soldiers. Check out all AUSA swag at www.shop.ausa.org. So, Major, moving on to one of my favorite topics now, fitness. The Army's taken a comprehensive approach to soldier fitness through its Holistic Health and Fitness Program, also referred to as H2F. What's the overall concept of H2F, and why was it created? You actually have hit on a great topic that I got to tell you is what I think is the most important thing I have seen the Army do in helping us get after changing the culture of the Army and trying to really get on the demands of meeting what we think is going to be required of our soldiers in modern combat today. So very often, and I'm sure we will talk about this as well, Everybody zeroes in on the ACFT, and then it becomes about how many leg tucks you can do or you can't do. It is a very small portion of the holistic health and fitness framework, which really gets that and encompasses all aspects of human performance. And so what do I mean by that? What does that mean in the simplest of terms? It gets after sleep, nutritional, spiritual, and mental readiness. And what those means, and it is incredible when you actually get at and read the doctrine of how well laid out it is, but it gets at that readiness. And probably most importantly, it talks about how we reduce our injury rates. And then more importantly, how we improve those rehabilitation outcomes after those injuries. And I'll never forget the article you wrote when you started talking about P2 profiles and non-deployabilities. And so I'll throw a few stats out there that haven't gotten better even since you were the SMA, right? So when we look at victory starts here in TRADOC, we already know that 70% of Americans between the age of 17 to 24 are unqualified for military service. That pool for recruits has continued to dwindle, and it really gets after this effort. We already have 70% of our active component soldiers and 25% of our reserve and national guards that are, in essence, obese. And then 55% of our active component soldiers sustain a musculoskeletal injury each and every year. So what does that mean for us in real terms? So we have about 10 million limited duty days, which turns into about $577 million annually in patient care. That gives us about 37,000 non-deployable soldiers who are non-deployable due to medical reasons. So even if we reduce that 1%, that 1% reduction, non-available rates, that saves us a simple cost of $40 million. So when we look at this, the way I would put it is H2F is the world's largest human optimization program. And I'll tell you, simply put, it is modeled after our professional and collegiate sports teams, and it does take that holistic approach to being a soldier athlete. So, Major, that's an outstanding uh, overview quick, but what are we going to see in five years? I mean, so how is this thing going to evolve over time? You know, it's got to compete with resources just like everything else in the Army. So can you talk to our listeners about where we're going with H2F? Here's the good news, SMA. We've been moving out with H2F for two years. And good or bad, it has not been a thing on the front burner when you start talking about holistic health and fitness. That's always the ACFT. The ACFT dominates the space, and you know, in some ways it may be a good thing because it has allowed us over the last two years to run the pilots and what that means and how we move forward. So, for example, currently, today, as we speak, there are 28 brigades that have these interdisciplinary H2F performance teams. And you're like, wow, that's, that's a really fancy word. What does that actually mean? So here's what it means at the brigade level. We have teams that consist of physical therapists, 
registered dietitian, occupational therapist, certified athlete trainers, cognitive performance experts, strength and conditioning coaches, all at the brigade level that are directly associated with equipment that has been over the last two years given out to those brigades. And so we will also continue to fill these H2F teams up to an additional 10 brigades each year starting in FY23 with the goal of 110 brigades of H2F teams by FY30. Well, I appreciate that, Sergeant Major. So the Army is vested. There is a plan. We're going to get there in all the units. I can tell you, talking to some soldiers out there, the units that do have these, they can already see the difference. Sergeant Major, you kept mentioning ACFT. And for our listeners out there, we simply can't have a Soldiers Today podcast without talking about it. But that's not what I'm going to jump into next. We are going to talk about it. But I want to talk about another subject that soldiers constantly talk about, and that is height and weight assessments. Now, the SMA mentioned this during the annual meeting as well. Height and weight assessments, commonly referred to as the tape test for soldiers, the SMA announced that the Army was going to review the height and weight assessment. Can you give us any insight on how that went or some of the findings of that review? So, great question, although I don't think my answer is going to suffice. So, yes, in Fort Bragg, we are in the data collection phase of an Army comprehensive body composition study, and we concluded that 29 October. So we literally just got done. I would be way in front of this study if I gave you any feedback on that right now, just to tell you. But here's what we do know. We have a test for height and body that is somewhat antiquated and has been in place for a long time. In general, It suffices to meet our requirement. Are there gaps? I think we're going to find out there are some gaps that we're going to have to get to. But when you rack and stack our current weight of doing height and weight and doing those assessments against what's on the market today, and you know this, you got to weigh in the economic, you know, what's that going to cost the Army across every formation where you can do this at, you know, platoon, company, battalion, and brigade. And so what I think we'll find out is that, you know, the results of this study are going to help us inform our Army senior leaders. And I think there will be future changes to the Army body composition program. But at this point, I think it would be uh, inappropriate for me to say that I have any conclusions because we have just literally finished the data collection phase. Fully understood, Sergeant Major. We won't put you on the carpet today, but we will call you back because I know this is a topic our listeners want to hear about. This is probably the number one question I got in every town hall I did. I'm glad we're looking at it. You're right. It's got to be feasible and affordable, like you mentioned. But more to follow, listeners, on that. We're going to call Sergeant Major back and invite him back on the show once they have the full report ready to release. So, Sergeant Major, we're going to do it. I know uh, you mentioned the term a few times, and our listeners are always eager to hear what's going on. And TRADOC has the lead for the ACFT, the Army Combat Fitness Test. We've been working on this for some time, years. Sergeant Major, I'm just going to cut to the chase. Give us the update. What's going on? All right. So the update, our ACFT, it is appropriate. So there will be a decision on moving forward with the Army Combat Fitness Test and getting a four-record fitness test for the Army all compost. I think that decision will be made at the end of December in reference to the ACFT. Again, that decision is up to the SEC Army and the SEC Army alone, but I feel positive that we will have a record physical fitness assessment. That decision will be made in December and will be in full effect by April. Bottom line is, again, this is not going to be the answer that anybody wants to hear yet, but that decision has not been made. But I feel very comfortable that the Army is moving in the right direction and will get this thing solved quickly. And more importantly, we have been engaged with this ACFT, and I have taken the ACFT about six times now, and I watch our soldiers. As a matter of fact, I would just tell you personally, I had the opportunity to work with CIMT with an H2F team. In SMA, what we did is we took about 10 soldiers. One had had a broken ankle. We had a couple that were in different stages of postpartum. Others that had had shoulder and surgery injuries. 
And so we kind of picked a population that honestly had been struggling with physical fitness. And for about four months, we did PT using the foundations of holistic health and fitness and then using the ACFT as the principal driver for how we put together a training program. And of those 10 soldiers, nine of them were all able to pass the ACFT after four months. And it didn't just have an effect on their physical fitness levels. SMA had an effect on them as being soldiers. And I would say it kind of permeated through the holistic approach that they took, whether it was a physical fitness requirement or having to work long hours or work on a weekend you could see the changes. And so I know that's not really an answer to your question with the ACFT, but I feel confident that we will have the ACFT locked in to move out in FY22. Well, sorry, Major, we won't hold you to any solid answer yet today. We understand decisions have to be made, but again, maybe we'll combine that with the next podcast and the update on the tape test. So, Major Hendricks, it was a pleasure to have you with us today. We hope you'll come back again and join us. We really do. And I'd like to give you the last words. Do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to provide our listeners? No, SMA, it's always an honor to come on here. And I just thank you, Troy Welch and General Brown. Really good to see the leadership there in D.C. and really get back to the profession of arms and being able to look not only our soldiers and our peers, but kind of the enterprise at large, being able to get together, whether it was afterwards and having dinner, whether it was an event or speaking on a specific topic, that really matters. And I'm glad the Army is moving back in that direction. And so as you continue to give us the opportunity to talk about these important subjects, I just want to personally thank you as we move forward. And most importantly, everything that we are discussing here, you can always, if you want to know more, please go to the TRADOC website, and these are all being defined, more information, and how you can just reach out to me personally, because I think we are moving in the right direction, and it's just an honor to be considered the TRADOC Sergeant Major at this point. Well, thank you, Sergeant Major. Victor truly does start there at TRADOC, and thanks for your time today, Sergeant Major. And like he said, if you want to know more, there's a lot of content there at the TRADOC website. You can find it by going through army.mil, but there's always something new going on in TRADOC because if uh, you're a soldier, you've been touched by TRADOC. Our time has come to an end. To close this edition of Soldier Today podcast, all of us here at the Association of the United States Army want to thank Command Sergeant Major Hendricks for joining us today, giving us an important update on just a few of the things TRADOC is doing to improve our Army. As Army alums, I can say from all of us across the country, thank you and the entire TRADOC team for what you have done and all that you continue to do for the United States of America and the United States Army. Soldier Today podcast is part of the Army Matters podcast series, brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission, educate, inform, and connect with the total Army, our industry partners, and supporters of a strong national defense. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. Join us next week here in the studio for another great podcast. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Army Matters Podcast on iTunes and everywhere podcasts are found. The Army Matters Podcast series is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission to educate, inform, and connect with the total Army, our industry partners, and our supporters of a strong national defense. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. Have a great Army day. Hua.